Welcome back, everyone, to the Formula Podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Carlson, here to share with you my experiences, experiments, and conversations on designing a fulfilling life in whatever form that means for you. But when we talk about a situation, when we describe something, we tend to focus in on a specific part of it. Sometimes we focus on the positive, like what's going really well, what you're excited about, and you feel the impacts of that. Sometimes we focus on the negative and that really can, well, for me at least, it can put me in a bad mood, you know. It's focusing on the, the thing that didn't go well, even though 99% did, I'm still focused on that 1% I want to improve. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is our next guest is an author and hypnotist. So he's really an expert in, in how the words that we use, how we describe things can have an impact on us, especially through the form of hypnosis. He's going to dive a bit more into that since he is the expert. Really excited to have hypnotist Jason Lynette on the show today. Now he's hypnotized over 250,000 people and he's going to share his experiences and lessons learned from that. But before we kick that off, let's hear a quick word from our sponsors. All right, all right, all right. Let's give a quick shout out to our first sponsor of this week's episode, Lady Boss. Lady Boss is a women's health company that provides workout plans, supplements, all kinds of stuff to help women really live more healthy, at least physically better lives. And it was founded by Kaylin Poulin. Hopefully she'll be a guest of the show here sometime soon. Head on over to the formulapodcast.com and click on the sponsored products page if Lady Boss products sound like something that would be interesting for you. Our next sponsor is Liquid Web. Now, if you're looking to launch some type of e-commerce store, drop shipping, whatever it is, you know, maybe you've listened to the episodes with Adrian, Ketsu, or all three of us, we're talking about our different e-commerce ventures that we've gotten into. Liquid Web has these pre-made solutions just for you guys. So they were also nice enough to hook up Formula Podcast listeners with 33% off all their products. So if you type in Formula 33 on the checkout page, you're going to get 33% off whatever you decide to pick up over at Liquid Web. Dot com. Now, let's get on to the show. Jason, thanks for taking the time to sit and chat with me today. I actually watched your TED Talk again just to kind of do a quick refresher on everything that you do. And I have a lot of questions, but I'm really excited to kind of hear from you and hear your story. Yeah, absolutely. So the story goes back to being in another career at one point where I was working, of all things, in professional theater. I was working in management behind the scenes. So not quite the actor on stage, but the wizard behind the curtain calling cues and helping all those creative people get along and just burning out beautifully, which the revelation at this point is the hobby at the time, thanks to seeing someone back at my college, was actually hypnotism. I had originally seen one of those stage hypnosis shows and just was fascinated. And it became this quest of learning as much as I possibly could. And over time, this was kind of developing into a presentation that would eventually become assembly for high schools with a motivational message inside. And the phrase that just because you're good at something doesn't mean you have to do it the rest of your life. I found myself leaving that old career and I've been full time as a hypnotist ever since. So working in the respects nowadays of whether it's individual clients or some of the work I do with people in business of overcoming public speaking fears or fear of failure, or even at times fear of success and just taking that message to a much larger audience. That's kind of the thumbnail version of who I am and what I'm up to these days. How did you make that jump from theater into hypnosis? Because, well, especially management. I mean, if you just said, yeah, I was an actor and then I really got into this hypnosis thing, (laughs) that makes it more sense. But if you're in management, that's kind of like they're very different things. Well, for that, I think I could best sum up the management story as to here's a day where there's a prop that's on the stage that is not in the right position. And we're talking a coffee mug where the handle is pointing the wrong direction. And we're having to have the conversation that the handle of the mug should be pointing that direction, not this direction. And I'm now commenting, well, no one ever picks up the coffee mug. Can we just glue it to the stage? And now the designer of the set is going, no, we cannot glue it down because it would not be glued down in their house. 
And I'm having to smile and nod because this guy has several Tony Awards, but respectfully, he's a bit insane. So the aspect of something of that nature would be an hour of my day. Creative minds needing to have a little bit of a manager coming in to get everybody working along and being friendly with each other, which if that's not psychological training, I'm not sure what is. So it was a natural transition to then become the manager of my own business and the aspects nowadays where I'm not necessarily doing the same thing day in, day out and just that management of that intentional three ring circus aspect of how I like to work things. The, the transition was not as abrupt as it would often seem because the hypnosis had been a hobby for at least five years at that point. So there was a helpful discovery of realizing the part-time job was actually earning a better income than the full-time job because it turns out nonprofit arts are nonprofit for just about everybody involved. So I had that ability in the last year of the management career to, let's say it is, to incubate and really get things up in motion. It's where, for example, at the time you and I are recording, I'm moving my office in the next two to three weeks. So this has been something that's been the works for quite some time. Going into a temporary space because the new space needs a bit of construction and I'm just renting a you know one month space for a moment. But here's a span of time where I'm intentionally working less, yet using that as the time to go, okay, let me make sure my team is going in and updating forms, updating emails. So that transition was very strategic because it was the timing of let's get everything up in motion. That way, as soon as I pivot, there's no lag in my schedule. There's no lag of income coming in. I guess, how did that whole process work from when you started this like side business? Correct me if I'm misrepresenting the story. No, that's exactly right. It was where the benefit of working in a, let's call it seasonal schedule, and also just having a former career path where they were very willing to let me go off and uh, do different things. So that transition, I think this is helpful for anybody who's in a business where they're working for someone else and looking to go off and become that entrepreneur. So to use the Will Ferrell line of strategy, of using that time to really incubate, using that time to plan, using that time to start to build a little bit of momentum in the marketing. Quite honestly, there's a funny little span of time where I knew I was about to move from, at that time, Maryland to Virginia. I knew the schedule of what I was going to be doing. So I had a fully built out website promoting what was eventually going to become Virginia Hypnosis. And I just had an opt-in on that website a little sign-up sheet that said, we currently have a waiting list for new clients. Why? Because I didn't have a location yet to see people. So many people would find themselves in this type of situation and wait until they're, you know, the, if you build it, they will come mindset where let me wait until I'm actually in the space. Now my business is launched. Now I can get to work and just simply opening up that door and hanging up that shingle is not really enough to start up that business. You know, you've got to, if you want to go after law of attraction on this, you've got to really make sure the universe knows you're there. You've got to get out of the office and talk about what you do. So I was using that incubation time to build out every bit of the systems possible, get out there and talk about what I did. I mean, part of the backstory of all of this was that I went to a local networking group and I was expecting, okay, these are fellow business owners and fellow wellness related industries. And I was expecting this bit of a warm you know, reception of going, oh, welcome to the area. Here's some advice. And instead I was hearing this negative dialogue of it's going to be slow your first year. It's hard to get new clients as a new business owner. Maybe you should get some sort of part-time job to better finance this. And I was hearing this and this was coming from the local business community and just something about that just did not mesh with me, did not click the way that I knew it should be. And just simply put, I refused to buy into that premise. So I kind of looked around. This was what we like to call a bit of an away from strategy. And okay, well, what were all the things they were doing? They were sitting in a dark room and complaining about things. And just that did not mesh up with how I wanted things to go. So change your words and you can change your life. So I use that as every opportunity to get out into my community, talk about what I did, talk about the work that I did, start to drum up that interest, start to build what at the time was what I was nicknaming a uh, waiting list. So by the time the business was ready to launch, I had a packed schedule in my first month. That's brilliant because I think so many people would have approached that, like you said, where they 
show up, they open the door and then they're like, okay, well, I'm here now. Where's my customers? But it sounds like you went the approach of pre-launching a product online. You just did it in like a brick and mortar store, right? So... Right, which let's put this in the context of a student of mine that she was about to move from West Virginia to Hawaii, which that move itself should explain a lot of things, though parts of West Virginia are quite lovely, it turns out. And we were talking through this exact strategy and was able to build out, she had at least an idea as to here's the general area where I may set up shop. So local brick and mortar business. And we were able to finesse things in such a way that press releases were going out, radio interviews were going out. So by the time that all of her stuff arrived by ship in Hawaii and was now moved into her home, opened up the office by day one, they were clients ready to go. So always look at things from the business perspective as to, you know, not what will I do when I'm ready, but what can I start doing now so I'm even more ready? Yeah, I'm even thinking about some of the work that I do and I'm like, man, if you're planning on making a move or doing something different in the future, how can you be planning ahead really to prepare yourself for that day? So when the day comes when you open the new office or the new service at your business or you want to open up to more clients, how can you be prepared for that day or be like kind of when you said filling up your calendar, kind of filling up your leads, whatever it is, how can you be thinking about that? Probably months out, it's already done. You're not then starting at that point in time. Which this also brings up, because I know not everybody in your audience are people who are looking to open up a business. Let's bring this into a personal change context that if we look at, let's use weight loss as an example, as to so many people, the old joke is what's the best day to start a diet? Someday. <laughs> so instead to look at what are those things I can start to do now? And there's something to be really pulled from the mindset that everything is going to have a result somewhere in the body. And I'd reference, not many people know this guy's name, Jordan Syatt. He's a personal trainer. If you've ever seen anything from Gary Vaynerchuk, Jordan is the guy that Gary hired just to say, follow me around for a couple of years and get me in better shape. And Jordan in his own right is phenomenal. And it's this great quote of his that if you're perfect every single day, as you're trying to lose the weight, you might hit your goal in 12 weeks. If you're really good most of the time, would you settle for 14 weeks? So it allows us to be a little bit more flexible with the thinking of it. But if everything is going to have a result somewhere in the body, it's a matter of really stacking up. Here are these little wins that I can put in motion. And to really put that mindset to the place of not if I lose the weight, this will be good. If I can do this, if this works for me, it's like the old line that too many people are shooting all over themselves. <laughs> I'd say that people are ifing all over themselves way too much. So to switch that language again, change your words, change your life. So to take that mindset of when I've done this and position yourself in that outcome. Years ago, when most of my time was spent working with one-to-one -one clients, there's this woman who sent me an email going, I'm gonna be late about 10 minutes to my appointment, hope that's all right, and I respond, I schedule, so there's plenty of time, we're good. Because why? She was swinging by the local Goodwill, local donation place, as she put it, to get rid of the clothing that she's never going to fit in again. Just removing that as the option to go back to that size that was about 40, 50 pounds heavier than what she had gotten to as a result of the work we had done together. So she was really positioning herself of that place of, I'm going to make this work. Similar to my story of deciding, I'm going to open up this business, I'm going to sign this big, scary lease, and... I'm going to do this rather than, you know, kind of metaphorically off to the side of the swimming pool, dipping my toes in and going, well, it'd be nice to let's see what happens. Instead, that place of personal conviction, this is what I'm doing now. Yeah, I, I wanted to travel full time for the longest time and be like, yeah, you know, someday when this happens or if this happens, then I'll do it. I'm 31 now. And I remember I was 30 at the time. And I'm like, shit, if, if I don't do this now, <laughs> I'm running out of time to be like single and on my own and go do this and kind of live out of a backpack for a while. And I just was like, okay, I have to like, this is the day I'm leaving. No matter what happens, I'm leaving on this day. There's really no going back. So once I had that date on the calendar, and it was like, okay, everything has to be in order by this date. And there was actually a lot of stuff that happened that should have prevented me from going. Stuff in my business, personal life. It's like, okay, you know, I had several people be like, you know, you don't have to leave then. I'm like, ah, oh, I'm going. I've already made up my mind. Like, it's a thing that's done already. It's just more a matter of the day getting here. What you're saying, what I'm saying are very close to each other. Like, once you kind of make that choice and you say like, when, 
this day comes or how you put it a little more eloquently than I did. Making that choice and then taking those small interval steps to get there gives you a lot higher probability of accomplishing that goal or hitting that milestone, whatever it is, weight loss, moving, opening a business, than if you're just like, well, someday, right? Well, I talk about this in my book, Work Smart Business. I talk about it as the theme of we can do hypnosis or we can be hypnotic. What happens if you step into that result as if you're already there and operate from that position? Now, there's a, of course, a appropriate line inside of this as always goes back to the example of my references, by the way, will gradually get more obscure the more we talk together. Perfect. Because <laughs> you know that one sketch on In Living Color back in the day with Jim Carrey and David Allen Greer, where they're making fun of the mid-90s, the telephone psychics that were becoming popular at the time. And it's the Jim Carrey character playing the character of like this sort of country bumpkin going, my psychic told me I'd win the lottery and quit my job. Today I quit my job. I'm halfway there. <laughs> <laughs> so there's got to be some other steps in the middle of it. And that place of look back to my story that I shared a while ago of it may sound a little bit more glamorous to go. I jumped ship. I opened a business. I had a fully packed schedule. Well, what's underneath that was all of the preparation, all of the mindset that I've been putting into it, working with clients. You know, what's interesting is that as the work as the hypnotist, it's not always the mindset of what's wrong and how are we going to fix this. It's instead at times, what's great about you? How are we going to harness that? How are we going to put that to use in such a way that you can replicate it on your own? And I'm always pulling metaphors and stories out of the experience of working with people that here's the marathon runner that I worked with recently that was coming in for something extremely specific that here's the day, which the real lesson of working with her was that it turns out running a marathon is not that difficult compared to the training you have to do to get ready to run the marathon. The marathon turns out to be this, in her case, you know, maybe at most four or five hour event, which was this big thing. But the six months of preparation and training leading up to that moment was all of this time of investing and putting in the training, taking care of her body. So to look back inside of that, it's the preparation. It's the putting in the hours of actually getting there, especially nowadays in our reality competition world, especially with the talent shows. Here's the person who wins that show that it seems they're an overnight success, but they've been out there for 20, 30 years putting in the work to really get to that point. And what you're seeing is that end result. It's easy when society seems to make that end result like very glamorous, but then you never see everything else that went into it. I'm sure that, like you said, with you opening your new office and kind of kind of packing full your calendar before you even open the doors, it wasn't probably just like, oh, I put up a website and everyone signed up and that was it, you know? Right. <laughs> you know, there was probably years of experience that you went through that led up having that knowledge that you could, you know, put up this website and get those people to sign up. And then there was also all the training and probably reading books and practicing with your hypnosis practice where, you know, if you wouldn't have done that, you wouldn't have been prepared to basically walk in and be like, all right, where's my first client? Right. And to look at the work that I'm in, this is best summarized by it's about maybe 2014 or so when my then girlfriend, now wife, was watching me do a bit of a just demonstration of things. And this was just for a group of friends. And the story was, she goes, that was good, but you need to work on that expression on your face that's telegraphing. Holy crap, it's actually working. <laughs> That it's something that you can't really practice, but so much. There's a teaching strategy when I'm, you know, running a course for a group of new students about, you know, work with as many people as you possibly can because it's all about the customization to the individual. It's what we call client-centered hypnosis of matching the process to the client rather than the client to the process. And the same way as I'm now out there doing a presentation in the business world, you know, I've got a core presentation about hypnotic influence for business, yet still I've got to ask the questions, who are the people in the room? Who are the people that are there at this business? What's their pain point? What are those things we need to hit to really make sure they get the full value of this presentation? And then there's, of course, a bit of customization from there. But at its core, you still have to have those basic skills underneath it. Otherwise, what are you up there doing? Those skills take a long time to develop, at least in my mind. I'd kind of like to transition a little bit here now to the second part of the conversation where we talk a bit more about 
you know, hypnosis. And me personally, when I hear that, there's like this little bit of skepticism that comes up, which I feel like is fairly normal for a lot of people. I'm kind of curious when you meet someone who is a little bit skeptical or maybe like, okay, so you're a hypnotist, explain to me like what it is that you do and and maybe a bite-sized piece of like how it could be impactful for like an average everyday person. Right. And before I get into that, I'd give a bit of a foundation, a bit of a frame for those folks listening out here, which the mistake would be what he does is so different than what I do. And that's different than what I do. Always play the game of what is that like? You know, what's the story that's going on inside of this? And I'd give you a simple reference to kind of kick it off that there's a concept in hypnosis that we would use on the practitioner side of what's called the pre-talk, where we would talk about here's what's going to happen, here's what's not going to happen throughout the process. And up until about maybe, I'd say seven or eight years ago, and yes, I can playfully pat myself on the back for being part of the uh, foundation of moving this, which would be that the original hypnosis pre-talk would talk to those same things that you just brought up. You need to dispel the myths and misconceptions of the process before you begin, which will be helpful at some points with someone who's a little bit cautious, let's say, of sitting down with a person and saying, well, there's no loss of control. There's no loss of awareness. I cannot make you tell secrets, which pause there for a second. Trevor, if your concern hadn't yet popped up with the idea of maybe this is a person who could make me tell secrets. Now that I've brought it up, it's your concern right. now. So don't plant fears that are not necessarily there. So what I'm getting at, though, is let's just take a moment and redefine the process, because if we're holding on to some preconceived notion or perhaps some science fiction expectation, that's where things begin to crumble. So the working definition that most of us use nowadays is that bypassing of those critical elements of the mind, which is a very big jargon rich kind of statement. Let's simplify that. It comes down to automatic response in spite of those things that we're already aware of. So simple example, you could be driving in your car, thinking of everything other than driving your car, and you still end up where you'd like to go. You're watching a movie, you know it's all fiction, you know they're all actors dressing up and playing make-believe, and you might even know a few tabloid stories of some of the actors, yet we still get swept up in the story. But let's take that same mindset and consider on, let's say, the hypnotherapy side of things, what are some of those issues that a person would reach out to me to address? Here's that person who knows they're safer on the airplane, statistically speaking, than they were driving to the airport. And yet, in spite of that conscious knowledge, they're perfectly fine in the car, they're terrified on the airplane. There's that bypassing of that critical element. Here's that person who knows these cigarettes are killing them slowly. There's no valuable benefit of smoking those cigarettes. And yet, and that pivot is the term, and yet, there they are buying them carton at a time because that saves money because they're going to smoke them a pack and a half a day. Here's a guy who I worked with recently, with no offense to this profession. He has a master's degree in English literature and I believe Russian literature. And he goes with two master's degrees and a pending doctorate in another form of classical uh, literature. He goes, there's no jobs for that. I'm teaching freshman composition at a local college. So as he put it, I am the most qualified person in the room. Why am I shaking like I'm back in my third grade master's class. So to look here, and as I would say to these people, congratulations, you're already doing hypnosis. Let's show you how to use those powers for good. So it's these places where we can identify, here's something that's not quite lining up. It's where you can't quite throw logic at an illogical statement. Here's the person that may be at some sort of emotional eating trigger, and they're feeling that emotion, they're stressed about something, and they know that feeling is stress, that feeling is not hunger, and yet they're eating as a means to distract away from it. And there's no amount of that food that's really gonna resolve that stress trigger, and they find themselves stuck in that rut. So this is that process where I'm helping to take very often that stuff you're already saying to yourself. And through hypnotic language strategies, through rapid self-hypnosis techniques to step into that better peak performance, it's really at times more so that it's you and I working together and I'm giving you the skill set so that not only can you create that intended result, but now you can strengthen it on your own long after we've worked together. But at its core, notice that it began with the education as to here's what it is we're actually doing. The mind is active and alert the entire time. You're going to hear everything I say. You're going to remember as much as you would from any normal conversation. And we're not going to make someone bark like a dog or cluck like a chicken, you know, unless that's what they want.
<laughs> right. And that would probably be weird for everyone in the room, I would imagine, at that point. Well, I put it down to context that years ago I was doing a motivational program for high schools. And there were elements of what can be considered stage hypnosis in that program, though mostly it was something where I was teaching a positive message, which this is what eventually morphed into what I now do in the corporate world and the business speaking world. And one of the routines was that if you change the pictures in your mind, you can change the result. So the person I'm tapping on the shoulder now, when you open your eyes, it's going to be as if your hands are puppets and they're going to talk to you very loudly, very clearly. And suddenly the eyes open, they're looking at their hands and Bohemian Rhapsody starts playing and the hands are now playing out the parts, which then I turn this into a teaching metaphor of, well, as silly as that may have been, what happened there? We changed the expectation in the mind. If you can see yourself as that successful business person, if you can imagine, picture or think of yourself as that person asking for those referrals whenever the client is satisfied and telegraphing the next step of that communication rather than going, it'd be nice to again back to someday. It'd be good if I could do this instead. Put yourself in that scenario as if there you are already doing those appropriate building blocks to get your business up and running. So yes, it's a funny way of demonstrating it, but now it's memorable to do that. Well, if you're in my office and you and I are working on the fact that you're this executive that is suddenly getting nervous in your public speaking, and then if I started playing, you know, Freddie Mercury and Queen, you'd open your eyes and go, what the hell does that have to do with this? <laughs> so context is everything. So working with exactly what either the audience or what the individual wants to experience differently, that's what crafts the process. I'm curious what the process looks like when somebody walks into your office for the first time to work with you, whatever. I'm sure there's probably a lot of common things that you hear, whether that's struggling in my business, I want to grow it, maybe struggling in my personal life, because you do both professional and personal coaching, correct? Yes. Okay. So walk me through what that process looks like. Yeah. And for those of you listening to, again, you're probably not in my career path. So take from this the little nuances that I'll highlight inside of it that you can model for the sake of your business. But let's briefly just kind of sidebar for a moment to a networking environment where people would go to a networking event and they talk about the work that they do. Most people would get up and go, hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm the accountant. Hi, I'm David. I'm a life insurance agent. And they're doing the same thing as everyone else. I'd credit the author of the book Fascinate. Her name is Sally Hogshead. And she talks about the theme that different is better than better. And I really love that. It's my job at times to not just deliver the actual, let's classify it as hypnotic protocols to assist in personal change, but also to, again, let the experience become a suggestion, become a moment of influence as much as the actual work. So it's where as soon as someone is walking in the door or even as soon as I'm on stage to make sure that it's clear that this is going to be different than what you may have expected. So if it's a client walking into my office, as soon as they're in the door, we're getting to work immediately to immediately set things on their edge to turn things on their side. So their model of the world doesn't quite match up to the way it used to be. So to give some sort of quick, rapid hypnotic experience that immediately sets the stage for things can go in a way differently than what you possibly originally imagined, which let's put that in a stage environment where again, whether it's a rapid demonstration that kicks something off for the entire audience or simply beginning with a story to sweep people into the experience. Look at the way that almost from a back to the old career to from a theatrical perspective, how is it that we can completely turn that expectation on its side so that it becomes the this is different than what I expected it to be? So someone walks into my space and immediately there's some sort of rapid hypnotic experience that happens where something is happening in a way that they didn't normally expect, which may not necessarily have context right away, but the same way that I was able to turn someone's hands performing all the vocal parts of Bohemian Rhapsody and Queen, to turn that into a teaching metaphor of the same way that that can happen is the same way you can do this other thing in your business. The same way that you were looking at your hands, trying to keep those fingers apart from each other, and then they were drawing together simply because of how I phrased my words. That's how today I'm going to put the right words in the right order. And it's your mind and your body that already know how to make these changes. Make sense? Yeah, good. Come on back. <laughs> Immediately, the foot is in the door that this is going to be different than what you expected. Yeah, uh, I tell a quick story here that 
I'm going to give some references in the story that I just need to give a disclaimer. This is not a negative commentary on the psychological profession in any way, Mm -hmm. because there's many times where I'm referring someone instead of what I do to that world, or even here's a number of local psychologists, even psychiatrists, counselors who are going, well, Jason's kind of the master electrician (laughs) when it comes to hypnosis. Let's send you to the expert for that specific issue. So this is a commentary on one specific person using one specific technique, perhaps in a way that may not have been the best fit. So little girl has a fear of watching television, which is the mother put it is a fear that most parents wish their kids had, which will shortcut the story. Little girl about five years old saw something on television, which was taken out of context and now is terrified to go near the television. So Now that she's in elementary school and sometimes they show videos, this is now posing a bigger challenge. And even at eight, nine years old, little girl is going, yeah, I don't need this. This is, again, there's that disconnect. I know I don't need to feel this way. And yet there I've been feeling this way. Well, in my office at the time, I had a desktop computer with two monitors and I was taking notes paperless on an iPad. And I didn't know this yet, that a previous counselor she had been going to was trying to play the game of systematic desensitization. Let's watch a bunch of videos similar to the thing that, you know, made you afraid years ago. That way you get used to it. We're not talking graphic and, you know, violent images. Um, I'm leaving out some of the specifics for obvious reasons for confidentiality. That session could not begin until I crawled under my desk in my suit and unplugged the computer from the wall without properly shutting it down. So I ruined some files, it turns out. And I threw my iPad down the hall and I smiled and said, we do things differently here. (laughs) Because she was expecting that coming to my office, I'd be showing her videos the same way the other person had been doing it, which clearly for her in that situation wasn't working. I'm not saying the technique doesn't work for some of the people some of the time, yet for her, it was clearly about the worst thing you could have done because it made the issue even worse. So again, the hypnotic, let's call it, you know, environment that I was building was that again, in a very provocative way, crawling under my desk, unplugging the computer from the wall, throwing an iPad down the hall. It wasn't a case that it was well protected and smiling and saying, we do things differently here. What is it we can do to set the tone differently in such a way that someone realizes this is going to be different? Otherwise, let's take the stop smoking example. The only reason they're in my office is because every other, quote, conventional method that they've used so far clearly hasn't worked for them. So if I do anything similar to what they've attempted so far, we could probably expect the same result that brought them into my office. So again, different is better than better. What is it we can do to signify this is going to be different? I'm kind of curious, even what your office looks like, I mean, I think a lot of people would probably picture a lot of the same things walking into a hypnotist's office, right? So if you do things differently, I imagine that there's... I'm trying to figure out the stereotype (laughs) you're building. Go for it. I don't know. For some reason, I'm picturing (laughs) like motivational posters on the wall, something maybe like a Tony Robbins picture. I don't know. And, you know, some comfy couches maybe with some magazines. It's just a lot of (laughs) hanging their kitty posters. Let's keep it enough. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Well, I shared there's a bit of an update to this that thanks to a ongoing maintenance issue. I just closed on a new office yesterday. And again, construction is in the process of build out starting actually is tomorrow. So again, building that environment. Now, the side note to this is that in the shape of at least the business that I run, seeing individual clients is not the only thing that I do. Again, back to the transition out of the old career, Just because you're good at something doesn't mean you have to do it the rest of your life. And let's combine that with an adage that, of all things, comes from the days of vaudeville theater, which was that the amateur changes their act, the professional changes their audience. So years ago, I was quite happy, and I nicknamed this time frame as BC, as in my world it stands for before children. There was a time frame as now I've got a six-year-old and, as of tomorrow, an eight-year-old. So the experience that going into something and years ago, I was seeing 35, 40 people in a week. I was working these marathon schedules, which is working with individual client after client after client and realizing like any good infomercial at 3 a.m. in the morning, there's got to be a better way. So nowadays, I typically see only about, you know, eight to 10 people a week because I'm doing many other projects at times. So, you know, I'm in the course of teaching an online hypnosis certification course. I do a lot 
lot of live events. I was just in Colorado speaking at an event a couple of days ago. So the aspect of, you know, the world has become a lot smaller. Let me bring the world to me. So specifically, the space is laid out in such a way that, again, it's more the environment that I'm helping to set. I tend to say, and I forget where I got this advice years ago, no disrespect to her, but I don't need you reading People magazine in my office and finding out what Taylor Swift is up to this week. So what is it again? We can do hypnosis or we can be hypnotic. In my lobby, there's a book of testimonials. There's a clear stack of copies of my book. There's an image of, and it's not for the sake of ego, but there's testimonial stories that are on the walls. There's images from things that I've done. Here's a full page feature that a local magazine did on me last week, specifically about stopping smoking. And you're seeing and just getting that feel as soon as you walk in the door, this is a place where this happens. This is a place where people are successful, that there's even in the stop smoking category, there's these giant, almost clinical glass jars that are filled to the brim with cigarettes that people have thrown out, which from an environmental suggestion, people are now, because they've seen that on my website, they're walking into that space with the packs of cigarettes already crumpled up and throwing them in the jar even before we officially get started. The ability to, when you walk in, now in my new configuration, I've got to figure out something a little bit differently because the classroom in my space that I'm uh, leaving this week used to be at the front of the office space. Now it's going to be at the back just because of a different layout. And it used to be, let me give you the tour of the space, which what am I doing? I'm just stacking the expectation. And I'd say this next thing with ego and without ego and jokingly patting myself on the back that, you know, you're getting the proof that this is the guy who does this. This is the place where this happens, as opposed to this is weird. This is something out of the ordinary, other than there are in my bathrooms. So there's an introduction to a nice statement. <laughs> yeah. In my bathrooms, almost kind of in a playful way, I found these actually, of all things, just on Etsy. There are these iron sculptures that are the chemical compounds of dopamine and serotonin the feel-good hormones, the pleasure hormones of the body, that when someone's making a positive change, this is often what's firing off. And my graphic designer right now is building this little uh, sort of like a museum placard to go in there along with them to explain what they are. So again, something that is not quite, let me use the technical terminology, woo-woo, <laughs> where you walk in and it's just weird and you're going, what the heck is this place? You're seeing here's a professional environment but again, everything is stacking that expectation appropriately that this is the place where this happens. From my perspective, you have a really solid understanding of what the experience is going to be like. You've kind of designed it for when they walk in the door to when they meet with you the first time to when they eventually, for some reason I want to say graduate, but I don't think that's the right term whenever they've... That's actually the terminology that I use. Oh. I, I look at a person and say, my goal is to look at you and say, professionally speaking, I hope to never see you again. <laughs> right. <laughs> and let that be a positive phrase. Though, of course, if something needs attention, you know how to reach out to me. Mm -hmm. In the words of my accountant, this is both a great business model and a horrible business model. <laughs> All right. Because the goal is to work with them that brief span of time and get that result and they're good to go. And, you know, it's where actually today is a good example. When I'm back at the office a little bit later today, because of some other projects that are going on, I'm only seeing two people. Both are coming in by way of referral. So as much as if you look me up further online, I'm kind of in the business world, too, teaching people how to run their businesses and doing the here's how you do the outbound marketing, how you can get found. Here's how you craft the story of a webinar in a very compelling way to draw in, again, everything we've been talking about of a physical space. We can take that into the digital world. At the same time, though, the best business model is raving fans. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the best way to get them is to actually help them accomplish their goal, you know? Right. To actually do the work you promised you said you would do. <laughs> yeah. Always good. <laughs> Weird how that works. Weird if you just do what they paid you to do, that they like you. Which of all things I'm flashing to the most, again, obscure reference. Back in the early 90s, there was a sketch comedy show on MTV called The State. And this was the origin of all things, which eventually became like Reno 911 and like the guys who did Thomas Lennon and Michael Ian Black and that whole crew of people who did like they did the Night at the Museum movies. It's the sketch comedy show. Show, there was a sketch about a mailman who was delivering tacos. And it was this family having to have this conversation with the mailman going, which is, I'm sure, the exact reference you expected when you invited a hypnotist on your program. But they're having this conversation about, well, here's the problem. We really like the tacos, 
but we also really need our mail. Oh, I know, but the bag is only so big. I can only bring one. <laughs> <laughs> so looking at we do have to deliver the service that we promised, you know, so I'm working with a contractor for some build out of the space to pull out, you know, old ugly carpet and put down, you know, wood floors. I've hired David because I know he delivers what he promises. I've seen his work for the last number of years that I've known him. And when I simply say, hey, I'm going to drop off these paper towel dispensers for the bathroom, which is exactly why we get into business. I know I can just simply say, hey, could you put these on the wall and just charge me for it so I don't have to do the install because that's not my skill and it's going to be all right. Right. You know, so again, always deliver it. So, but again, look at the filter around it. There's a phrase that I'm going to use cautiously here, which is that I say this in my hypnotic world to other practitioners, we can apply principles of placebo on techniques that actually work. So at its core, here are principles, here are methods that actually work, yet it's also the framing around it that keeps that result in motion. And I give a quick example that years ago, I went through a bit of a wacky allergy issue and the doctor who I was seeing at the time goes, well, okay, well that one didn't work. Here, let me give you this other one and you know, try it out. If it actually works, let me know. And I looked at him and go, how motivated do you think I am to get that prescription filled and follow through with it? It was also giving the disclaimer that, well, this is a newer medication. There's no generic of it yet. It's going to be kind of expensive, but, you know, nothing else has worked. So you might as well try this one, which there's wonderful healing language to which I said, what are the bullet points of this medication? What are the details of this? And he was explaining some points that I then go, can I try something out here? Yeah, it's just me and the doctor in the room. I go, okay. So um, I understand that up until now, the other medications, Claritin, Zyrtec, the inhaler hasn't been working for you, but this is a brand new medication, which this company just launched that takes the strengths of these two medications, but by combining them, they re-engineered the prescription. So it removes this other side effect of drowsiness, which I know was something you weren't able to handle with. Now, this is so cutting edge that there's no generic of it yet. However, the research is now suggesting people get a faster result to this one. However, as we've already discussed, these medications need to be in your system for like eight to 10 days before you see results. They'll keep track of how well it's working for you. And if you start to see some benefits earlier, here's my email address. Let me know as soon as possible so I can recommend it to other people. And the doctor now looks at me with this confused puppy dog look and goes, how the hell did you do that? I go, what do you mean? He goes, I don't have any allergies, but I want to take the medication now, <laughs> which again, let's take the core of it. This was something that in their clinical trials, I'm not in the prescription medication world, but in their world, they had already verified this is something that works. And the difference was now, what is the framing? What is that expectation we can put around it to one, increase compliance so people are actually using the thing to get the intended result, and two, following through and actually noticing that result. So as an example of this, we can give a hypnotic suggestion working with a weight loss client to eat less and feel more satisfied. That's kind of the expectation of the process. But what happens if I also now am suggesting a heightened awareness of the satisfaction as you can feel the nutrition being absorbed into your body and now calibrate the difference of how you feel differently when you're eating healthier foods versus the unhealthier items that brought you into the office, which anybody who's ever made any change in their health can recognize these things. My son had his sixth birthday party a couple of weeks ago, and I'm someone I, I don't drink, I don't use drugs, and I just don't really have a sweet tooth. Yet I had the cupcake and we then went out to eat and had something else. And I was practically feeling the equivalence of a hangover the next morning. So this is a natural signal that when we eat healthier, we feel better. When we don't eat healthy foods, we kind of feel it the next morning. And what am I doing in my hypnotic suggestion? I'm highlighting that awareness, which is doing something in a bit of an indirect way. It's building the assumption that the person is going to be eating those healthier foods. Because now I'm drawing that focus, I'm shining that spotlight on the fascination and the satisfaction you're going to be feeling as your body can notice the difference as you're enjoying that better nutrition. And now I'm not just saying, eat healthier foods. I'm not going for the direct linear result. I'm throwing that in as what we call a presupposition that that's going to be part of what you're going to be doing as you leave this office. That's now assumed rather than the target, if that makes sense. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Someone like me, I don't live in Virginia or near you, but at the same time, I could use some of the benefits or not just the benefits, but developing the habits or I want to say rewards of working with someone like you. Mm -hmm. 
there's a good chance I'll never live in the area and wouldn't be able to work with you on a consistent basis. So how can I take like, what you do with your clients and some of the practices that you use and maybe apply them to my life without the ability to meet with the hypnotist on a regular basis? Right. And I give you a context for this that I kind of shook things up in my industry a few years ago because it's a world where some of the older organizations that hypnosis is not licensed anywhere in the U.S. It's instead organized by private organizations which have very strong checks and balances and ethics boards. Then I actually train the trainer nowadays for one of the major groups. And there's a group that used to be the largest and the oldest in our communities. Now they're just the oldest and unwilling to kind of change with the times that the belief used to be you had to to physically be in the same room for it to be effective and kind of the byproduct of the speaking that I do and putting out programs online and launching the book and I do a podcast that does go out but it's really what we like to call in the business world micro niche it's for hypnotists who already do hypnosis <laughs> so <laughs> I've had many clients or folks like you who have found it and they go wow that was really interesting I'm not the audience for that am I it's like well it's not that there's trade secrets I'm someone who spends a lot of my time teaching other people how to do this stuff but because of that the phone will ring or the email will come in and just the other day I'm working with someone in Vancouver British Columbia more than 3,000 miles away here I am working with this client and it goes great and she goes can you work with my mother I go sure she goes she's in Ireland I go great and I send over the Skype or the zoom link and it's as if we're in the same room that being said to the mindset of duplicate yourself in fact let me give you and your audience a bit of a free benefit here if you just head over to the website Site, worksmartbusiness.com forward slash confidence. Actually, I'll give away something that I usually sell on my website for about $50. It's a free 15-minute uh, hypnotic program that allows you to turn on your own peak performance state of mind to break out of those moments where it feels like we're in a funk and become that best version of you. The benefit of this being an audio is you can actually listen to it as many times as you want and you'll be learning a specific method that you can do practically anytime, anywhere, and no one knows you're doing something something to actually turn on that ability to decide to feel that confidence. And I'll mention that website again, just because it's a bit of a longer link to simply worksmartbusiness.com forward slash confidence. That's where you can grab that, that free giveaway that I'll share with everybody there. But yeah, working with folks around the world, thanks to our modern technologies. So the world has become a whole lot smaller. Yeah, I appreciate the giveaway too. We'll throw that link into the show notes so any listeners can go check that out if they'd like to. I'm wondering as well, so you have the capability of working with people. So outside of the office, what types of habits or behaviors do you encourage people to perform or to implement into their daily routine that can help them to use some of the skills or behaviors that you recommend to their advantage? So here's a mindset going into this. Let's say the person is coming into my office because they want to quit smoking. And that's a story that up until now has been marked by failure. And we need to immediately change the expectation. Otherwise, it's a game of here's another thing that's not going to work for me. So I've got to just simply land the statement at some point that you always knew you were going to quit smoking. Otherwise, you wouldn't have tried in the past. So the fact that you've been at this for years trying to stop proves that it was always the game of when rather than if. If it was if, you wouldn't have even bothered trying. So before we even get started, I want you to think about everything up until now as preparation or like the athlete in training, because eventually when you find that one thing that's going to get that result, then it's just all done. And everything up until then has been the training, the workshopping to get it in motion. So I give that as a filter to say that the things that I personally do may not be a fit for everyone who's out there, that I'm connecting with you extremely early in the morning because that's a time frame that I thrive when about 10 years ago, oh God, no, was I going to get up at four in the morning and talk to somebody? <laughs> right. <laughs> so look at everything that you do as this experimentation mindset. The classic story of the sort of characterized version of Thomas Edison and his light bulb was that he would celebrate when it wouldn't turn on. When the glass shattered, when the whole thing exploded in a ball of fire, his lab assistants thought he was insane because clearly it didn't work. But as he put it, the discovery of what doesn't work is just as important a discovery of what does work. So the benefit of the weight loss world, all of this stuff works, you just have to do it. 
you know, and I did the exercise classes for years and went, I just don't like that. I was an endurance runner for a while. I did it for like three years. And the discovery was, hey, I can run two miles and I don't hate my life versus running 13 or even 20 miles and having to run my life around it. Or I can go to the gym and lift weights and feel strong all the time. You know, so we discover over time what works for us and what doesn't work for us. So rather than the mindset of either the binary, yes, it works or no, it doesn't look at everything as getting me closer to that discovery of what does work. So it's where too many too often people stick themselves in that position of that doesn't work for me to step off to the side and said, well, how can I make that work better? You know, how can I adapt that? I, I give a personal example of I, out of laziness, discovered years ago that I wasn't that hungry in the morning. So I just kind of waited till around lunchtime to eat, which was, again, I wouldn't even call it a life hack. I was just lazy right. <laughs> and going, hey, I can enjoy a bigger lunch this way. I can enjoy a more robust meal if I was trying to either, you know, lose a couple of pounds or something of that nature. And a few years later, someone goes, oh, so you're doing intermittent fasting. And it was a Facebook chat at the time. And I'm having to Google that in another window going, what is this? Oh, yeah, that's that is what I'm doing. Oh, yes, yes, I am doing intermittent fasting. <laughs> and that worked for me for a span of time. And then I started to lift weights in the morning. And dear God, I needed food and nutrition right away. So that stopped working for me because just again, I had changed my goals. I had changed my routines. So as you go about everything, look at it from the filters of every step is getting you closer to that thing that is going to work best for you. That again, Back to how we started this conversation, just because you're good at something doesn't mean you have to do with the rest of your life. And it always comes down to there's no good or bad. It's a matter of what fits within your goals right now. Yeah, I think that's something to, to really hold on to is I've made this mistake before where you, you know, you make this list of what your ideal day is, you develop these habits and then things change and all of a sudden the new lifestyle, whatever it is, maybe you change a job, maybe you have a shorter or longer commute, maybe you don't have time to exercise in the morning anymore. And I mean, I've personally done this where I'm like, oh man, my everything's falling apart. I'm not exercising in the morning. Oh, this is terrible. But really it's being able to kind of adjust. So I get this point in time, I'm usually in a different country every month. My schedule and my time, like how I handle my days is completely different. And I've really had to develop the whole, all right, well, I'm in this place. It's actually easier for me to go running every day than it is to go to the gym. So now I'm going to run for this month or whatever yeah. it is and being flexible. Yeah, I was in Colorado last week and day one, I go into the hotel gym and it's a really nice space and I'm able to do something kind of similar to what I would normally do at home. Day two, I go there and there's another conference going on and the room is packed and I can't even find a free dumbbell. So it's like, oh. OK, and I go up to my hotel room and like do push ups in different positions and do something as like, OK, well, yeah, I can get something done, you know, rather than going, nope, can't do that. So the flexibility of it, there's a story that I think really illustrates this, that it's this weight loss client that I'd work with and he calls up. He's dropped about 40 pounds by the time he calls me. And I used to live downtown Baltimore. And sort of the amusement of the story is I knew the place he went to. I knew the restaurant he was talking about. It's kind of dive bar location that here he is. He's down about 40 pounds and he's out with friends. It's Super Bowl Sunday. They know the owners. They've got the table right by the TV. And I mean, they are there for the full experience. And the friends are freaking out on his behalf because he's ordering pizza, he's ordering wings, he's ordering pitchers of beer for the table. And they're all concerned going, hey, Bill, you lost the weight. You don't have to eat like the rest of us. They got salads, right? And what Bill goes, he goes, in the time frame that I used to eat an entire entree size pizza to myself, I'd eat the entire appetizer pound of wings and I would drink a lot of beers and that kind of experience and at least walk home. He goes, you know, I only had like one or two slices of pizza. I had like a handful of wings. I just really wasn't interested in drinking that day. So I barely even finished the first glass of beer. And he goes, here's the part that stuck with me. He goes, for the first time ever, I enjoyed the hell out of that food. He goes, which was kind of concerning because he goes, I eat there like once a week, if even that. And I never really remembered tasting the food. It was more, you know, let's call it procedural that just because we're there, this is what we eat here. He goes, and it kind of threw me off that this restaurant actually had decent food. 
And again, I enjoyed the hell out of it in that moment. So <laughs> let's take the weight loss example again, where here's the person I'm working with, whether they're in the same room as me, whether they're somewhere else in the world, and to have that occasional moment to enjoy that indulgence. Because again, I mentioned before, not for any specific strategy, I'm going to eat more of the savory things if I want to you know, enjoy something, but I'm not going to go out of my way for the dessert unless we're at Founding Farmers in the local area and they've got that carrot cake, which is just to die for. It's like, yeah, I'm going to order that. It's okay. Again, back to the Jordan Syatt quote of perfect every single day for 12 weeks, hit the goal. Pretty good most of the time for 14, you're going to hit the same result. Relax. You know, here's the moment where I mentioned referrals back and forth with the psychological world. Now, what I'm about to say may not be a fit for everybody, of course, yet she normally I have a policy with my stop smoking clients that you've got to be the one calling me. You know, it's going to be your goal. It can't be she says you need to quit. He says you need to quit. Doctor says, well, I'm here because my doctor said no. It needs to be because you're at that place of going, I just don't want to be doing this anymore. The exception was this local psychologist who we send people back and forth consistently. And she goes, I know you don't take clients that you haven't talked to in this category, but my brother is coming back from his third tour of duty in Afghanistan, and he's been hounding me because he knows I know a little bit of hypnosis and he wants me to help him quit, but I know you can do it better. Can you see him the day he gets back? I'm like, yes, absolutely. Let's set this up. And he came in, rock star of a client, ready to change, phenomenal process, did great. And she calls up, it's like nine months later, and she's tattling going, you need to call John. <laughs> Why? He's smoking again. And I call him up and I go, hey, your sister tattled on you. How's it going? He goes, OK, so here's the deal. Zero cigarettes since we saw each other. Like people can be smoking them around me and I've got zero interest in them. He goes, I've had two cigars. That's what she's talking about. My guys that I was you know, on duty with over there in the Middle East, we did a poker night. I had a cigar. That was it. And sister's now concerned. And I'm going, OK, so any cravings? No. How's the cigar? He goes, as soon as I light it, I kind of regret it, realizing this is a 30-minute commitment, and my friends are hounding me because they bought really nice ones, and I have zero interest in finishing it. Like, okay, yeah. Can I give you some advice? What? If you're going to have two a year, enjoy the hell out of it. Buy one you can really like. If it's going to be that rare of an experience, enjoy it. You know, now, of course, don't necessarily, you know, only the appropriate dosage of cocaine from time to time. Let, let's take that one out of the <laughs> conversation. Something of that nature, which, you know, I don't drink these days. But here's the client who goes, I stopped, but I knew it wasn't no longer the game of now. I'm always in recovery. Now, of course, if that's a fit for the person to maintain the change, by all means, more power to them. Keep that up. This guy was funny when he called me. He goes, originally, the story was, I need you to hear the entire thing before you cast a judgment. He goes, because I'm drinking a lot. I'm having nine beers a night. But hear me out. They're Michelob Ultras. So it's the equivalent of like two decent IPAs. I'm like, forget the alcohol content. How much are you in the bathroom? He goes, that's why I'm calling you. Oh, man. So, which is a very, very low alcohol beer. It's like the one's like 60, 70 calories a bottle. And he goes, it's no longer the game of I have to have it every single night. He goes, I may have a cocktail once or twice a month, if even that. To which this is the guy who's threatened to go online, leave a review for me that says, Jason Lynette made me drink on purpose. <laughs> yeah, man, I think about some of the behavioral changes I've gone through, habit changes, whatever it is. It's like it's sometimes it's really difficult to give up something that you actually enjoy, like permanently. The whole like I can never do this again makes it a much bigger challenge than just being like, okay, maybe I need to. Well, let's look at the language on that, because the moment you say I can never do this again or I can't do this, you are lying to yourself. Mm -hmm. And I say this to my stop smoking people that by fluke of where my office, the office that I'm moving away from, you hear the jokes about New York City, the Starbucks across the street from another Starbucks. There are two 7-Elevens directly across the street from each other where my office used to be. And I tell them, it's like you could go there, credit card, swipe it once and buy a full year supply if you really wanted to. So to say to yourself, I can't do this is an absolute lie. So instead to harness the reality of the situation, well, I could, but now I know I don't have to. I could, but now I know there's always something better to do or part of the foundation at times of helping someone quit smoking. I could, but the measure of success is doing nothing. I can do nothing. This is easy. I got this. So to look at the nature of, and this is just out of standard hypnotic language, this is something I teach to the business world of an action followed by a result, a cause 
followed by an effect. So by saying I could, we're starting with an absolutely true statement that all parts of the mind can identify as being, well, the truth. But then the piggyback, now the suggestion is I could, but now I just don't need to. I could, but there's always something better to do. So to start from that position of truth, rather than you know the affirmation formula of looking in the mirror and saying, I have enough money in my children's college funds, which no, we don't, not yet, but I can put action to it. As I'm setting aside money in an automated way for my kids' education, I enjoy the feeling of their savings growing. You know, Now it's true in all accounts, and I'm not throwing out that lie where the part of the mind can perk up and say, no, you're not. So set action to those goals, but put a moment of truth at standard pacing and leading, as we would say in terms of persuasion, of start with that truism and then from there piggyback it into the change. So I could enjoy that, but now I just don't feel like it. You know, I made a choice. I have a much longer story of as to how I quit drinking. It was more so just I didn't feel good and I didn't like how I felt the next day. And I just kind of went, I'm done with this. Some friends have gone, oh, so you're sober now. I'm like, I wasn't drinking enough originally to earn the title of being sober. So, you know, to say I can't drink anymore. No, I could, but I know how I'm going to feel the next day. I could, yet I'm not going to enjoy it in a way that it should be enjoyed for the person who doesn't have an issue with it. Just it made me feel sick, which I've now shortcutted that story because it sounds much more intriguing just to say to people, I haven't drank since Mother's Day 2017. Makes it sound like... (laughs) What the hell happened? What were you doing beforehand? (laughs) I know, right? It just got to a place of, and quite honestly, the story was, I ate lamb that was marinated in wine and I was sick for two days going, oh yeah, that's right. That's what that does to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm done with that. Just, we reach that place where you have foods, you just know this thing doesn't make me feel good. You know, I mentioned the sugar hangover the next day after the kid's birthday party. But to take that mindset back to your original question, what I tend to suggest is go about the mindset of how do I become an expert as to the best I can feel, the best I can perform. How do is it we can build systems of something? So later on this morning, I'll be at the gym and I know here's my upper body sequence that I'm going to be doing. And almost like a video game, how do I one up the levels from last time? How do I get better at something? So rather than just do the same thing over and over, what is that continual improvement that I can do to something? The way that in business, I can track the numbers and see, okay, I'm this much of a percentage on top of where I was last year, which that helps to inform the natural state of business growth. Okay, I can invest in this consulting program. Okay, I can sign the papers yesterday to actually buy my new office rather than rent it and know that, okay, things are working and here's where I can know the numbers and the track tracking of it, the game of what got me into the weightlifting. I kept spraining my back because I was weak and I was clumsy. And now I know I can get on the floor with my kids. I can pick up my you know, six-year-old, my eight-year-old and play with them and know I'm not going to hurt myself the way that I did before I worked on building strength. So become the expert in your own strategies. And by doing so, you can replicate it in other parts of your life. The ways that I got into the strength training that really influenced the ways that I now run my business. So moving on to kind of the next, I mean, we've been talking about your daily habits a little bit. So I kind of want to move on to the last part of the discussion, which is what do you do personally? How do you apply some of these techniques that you teach other people? And then what do you do to really keep yourself performing at your highest level? I have the intro with a story. I'm out to dinner with a good friend a couple of months ago. And the opening of one of his stories was, I was explaining you to my wife. Okay. Just stop. (laughs) Just stop there. That's good. Thanks, I guess. (laughs) Well, the whole work smart branding, the training business that I do for hypnotists is work smart hypnosis. The training that I do for people in business is work smart business. And the term work smart is a bit of a command form. It's a bit of a call to action for me to work with purpose, to work with intention, to work with focus. That back to one of the stories we talked about earlier of signing the big scary office lease and going, I'm going to make this work that it came back to what are those things that I have to do consistently to keep the business running? You know, rather than sit and wait for the phone to ring just because I've hung up the shingle and I've opened the doors, if you build it, they will come is not necessarily the right business model. So to have a constant, understand the disclaimer of this next thing too, is that this works for me. I have a constant amusement with negative language used in a positive way, not profane language, but a constant satisfaction and dissatisfaction with a level of success. 
So to look at my business as it is in 2019 so far to date, I can look in my tracking of things and the software that I use and say, okay, cool, I'm up more than 50% to date as I was at this point last year. And to look and say, okay, so that's happening because of this thing that I'm doing, that's happening because of the book launch, that's happening because of the speaking that I'm doing, that's happening because here's the shape of how I've changed one of my main courses, which has made it more enticing. Yet that constant appropriate dissatisfaction to throw in the modifier word to make it positive again is to go, well, how can I do that better? How can I change up the model? So to look at things and go, how do I improve this? Again, that real video game mindset of the person who's playing some sort of game, and this is coming from a person who will play Nintendo Switch with my kids and then just turn it off because I go, I want to get swept into this. <laughs> but to go, how do I do that better? How do I improve upon that? So to look at, you know, not just the things that are working now, but that constant game of upping those levels, upping that game in such a way that I can get better at something. How do I take what I've done? And this is a big part of how I teach, which of all things, you and I were trading stories of stand-up comedians before we hit record here. The way that the comedian will tour for a year and then do that special on HBO, on Netflix or whatever platform is out there, because by doing so, this was George Carlin's terminology, he burned that material. He could not tour anymore with the act you saw him do on HBO because you'd be going, I already saw this. I don't want to see this again, which is funny in the comedy world, the music world. If you go see the band and they don't do the songs you came there to see, you're angry. But comedy, you want to hear something fresh. And if they're doing the same bit that they did on television, there's exceptions to this because there's the comedian Jim Gaffigan who comes out for his uh, encore and, of course, does 10 minutes of hot pocket jokes because that's why you know who he is. In the later years with George Carlin, when he was doing a Vegas act, there was new material, but then he'd go, you ever notice how baseball is different than football? And now he's into the old routine because that's where he was in his career and you wanted to hear him do the classics. So to look at the nature of comedy, they workshop it, they workshop it, they workshop it, now it's ready to go. But as soon as it's ready to go, as soon as they get the big opportunity to film the special, now they're going back back to square one to go, how do I do this better next time? How do I up my game? So in business and personal life as a parent, always the mindset of going, I know I can do this a little bit better. But to bring about a positive satisfaction and a positive critique of myself to go, yeah, I can level that up. I can do that just that little bit better. It's really what's going to drive that ongoing momentum and just that improvement as a person rather than going, here's what I do. It works, which if that's what's working for you, keep it up. But again, if your goal is to do things better year after year, to have that self-critical mindset to go, how can I improve upon this? You were talking about your client that was training to run a marathon. They said the hardest part was the six months of training. It's almost like if you look at it like, you know, you start on day one and you just stay on day one for the full six months, you're probably never going to get being able to complete a marathon. You know, you'll be really good whatever that day one training is. And that brings up something very important for people who are, you know, looking to learn something new as I spend a lot of time teaching others. The further you are in your journey, the less you need an educational event to be revolutionary from start to finish, which is not to try to claim that, oh, what I teach is not that good. I just need you to get one thing. No, it's to say that here are events that even I've been to. I have a you know, quest for ongoing education to constantly level things up. And here's the moment where I'm taking a class and I got one or two techniques whenever the people were leaving with a fully built out system and I'm going, yeah, but I got this one nuance and that one nuance equated to an extra $50,000 of income that year. So I got my money's worth by going to that event of recognizing where you are in your journey and what specific nuance do you need to improve things. And it's where, again, sometimes that littlest of improvement, I bring this back to the marathon runner. I brought it up because of her where she goes here. Suddenly I read the book. This is actually a really good book. She running by Danny Dreyer. And she goes, I read that book and suddenly I shaved about 20 minutes off my long runs because I just learned a better technique putting in less force and got a better result. We could talk about that for another hour. I think that because <laughs> I'm like, damn, I've learned a lot about that. The older I've gotten and the more experience I've gotten, because when I was younger, I think it was just like brute force everything. Right. But when you can get more efficient, that just really changes the whole game. Yeah, there's a quick story of uh, getting into the strength training and just learning a better form on a deadlift, which is a horrible name for an exercise. But there's a thing on the floor in a dead position and you lift it. 
There's the name. And just learning a better way to put the weight in my heels differently, how to brace the core muscles, how to grip the barbell better. Suddenly I was lifting 70 pounds more, you know, a matter of one session of just, you know, having better form, having better technique. So it wasn't just the game of chasing more weight on the bar and lifting heavier stuff. It's like, no, if I do it better, I can perform better. I think that's the case in just about every area. It's not always as apparent as it is when you're lifting weights. You can see it. You can feel it. There's a difference in the amount of weight you lift. In other areas, it might not be so apparent. Is there anything else that you try to do? I know you said you're always working on constant iteration and improvement in whatever your daily practices are. Is there anything that's really stuck with you over a long period of time? I'd say really the metaphors that have come from, I love getting inspiration from unique sources. So really the, these two things we've just talked about, even though I'm not someone who does stand up comedy, the mindset that they bring to it, there's an artistry to it to look at. I think this is still on Netflix. There's a documentary called Comedian, which is Jerry Seinfeld right after the TV show went off the air and he's prepping for the new one hour comedy special on HBO. And you get to see him struggle. You get to see him workshopping stuff and things not working well. The lessons I've learned from getting into strength training, it's not that every day is gonna be that personal record, but every day is getting you closer to that next personal record. So in business, there may be some days where I'm just in the office seeing clients, which is what got me started many years ago. But then again, the next week I'm on the platform delivering the keynote to a major business organization and it's still at its core the same basic skills just applied to a different situation and now the again amateur changes their act professional changes their audience and the real theme that's really driven my success over the last couple of years is the world has become a lot smaller so how do I take that message to the one to many? This is what you know motivated writing the book. This is what motivated getting out of the office and doing more speaking a few years ago and just broadcasting that message to more people. And how is it we can increase that reach? All right, Jason. Well, I feel like we've covered a ton of stuff. I mean, you know, it's been fun, you know, you know hearing your stories, talking about the different ways that tactics of uh, hypnotism can be applied in, in really everyday life. Maybe you want to cover the giveaway one more time and we can wrap it up from there. Yeah, and easy to find me online, and you'll love the way that I do this. You can just simply go to jasonlinette.com. Don't worry about the spelling. I own all the appropriate misspellings, so <laughs> type it however you'd assume, jasonlinette.com. You'll end up at the right place. That's where you can learn about my speaking. And then also head over to worksmartbusiness.com forward slash confidence. That's the link I mentioned earlier. That's that free 15-minute confidence hypnotic program. It's going to teach you what we call a method of hypnotic anchoring, where instead of having that good day on accident, you can actually activate that on purpose. So again, worksmartbusiness.com forward slash confidence. That'll also give you all my contact information too. But Trevor, this has been great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. I really enjoyed it and appreciate you taking the time to stop by. Hey guys and gals, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to Jason and I's conversation. I really appreciate it. And all you guys that continue to tune in, you're all awesome and you deserve a high five or a pat on the back. So if you want to check out the show notes for any of the links that Jason and I discussed, plus the link to his free little uh, download that he offered up for you guys, uh, you'll find that down in the show notes. Now, if I can ask you one more quick little favor, if you found this episode valuable or any of the other episodes that you've listened to, head on over to iTunes, Stitcher, whatever podcast app. I can't even keep track of how many of them that there are anymore. Whatever one that you're using, if you could give us a review, you know, five stars would be great, but uh, an honest review is always appreciated as well. That helps us get better too. So yeah, if you've got extra couple minutes, give us a thumbs up, five stars, whatever it is. I'll definitely owe you a, a coffee or high five or something the next time that we chat or meet. So that's a wrap for this week's show. I appreciate you guys stopping by and I look forward to seeing you next time.